You heard that right, people. You read the quote correctly. You read the title correctly. I took the EOS R5 out to a 10-hour wedding day shoot, and I was able to film with it throughout the entire wedding without it overheating one time. Tune in today. We're going to talk about it. I'm excited to talk about it. What's up everybody, James Jackson here, back again with another video. If you're new to my channel, I do tips, tricks, news, and reviews for the film and video making industry. So if you do like the content here, please make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell so you can stay up to date on all the content going forth. So yes, yes, it's yes, I did. I took the Canon EOS R5 out for a wedding. Oh, the thing that everybody said this was camera was not made to do I was, but I was really interested to see for myself how the camera will perform out on a wedding day. And I know some people would think this is risk, but I, as for someone who knew the limitations, I, and basically someone who's actually been working with the camera in long for contents prior, I felt really comfortable using the camera on the wedding day. And let me just tell you right now, we shot it, we used it throughout the entire day. We were using primarily shooting it at 4K 60 and 4K 120. We threw in a couple of 4K HQs and a couple normal 4K videos as well, but mainly it was 4K 60 and 4K 120 that I shot this wedding day four. As I said, the camera didn't overheat one time and we got a very happy client. So to me, that is a very successful camera. Now, I know probably you guys are wondering, BS, no way. How is it that you were able to do this? I mean, Matt, who is Maddie, the wedding guy, basically came out and said that it overheated after 20 minutes. It's not usable on a wedding. How in the world did you make it happen when so many other people who do these things day in, day out for, what, on their, for their careers? And you know what? Let me just say this. The techniques that I use for this video, and I need to put this caution. What I'm about to tell you guys is not like, I don't want you to take it as scripture. I don't want you to take it as absolute. Some of the things, the things I'm probably going to say, some of you are probably not going to like how I did it, but it's not the point of whether if you like it or not. The point is more of showing you guys that it is possible to make it, to make it happen. So. How was I able to do this? Well, there's really three things that I did that basically allow me to use it from prep, from the preparation all the way to the final shot where they were doing sparkles at the very end. So let's kick it off with number one. And number one is, it wasn't the main camera. It was not the main camera. It was not even the, the, main, the second main camera. The Canon EOS R5 was basically our B-roll, primarily just for B-roll shots. So shots throughout the preparation, uh, through the cocktail hour, and the reception. Mo notice I didn't bring up the ceremony, and I'll get to the ceremony in a second. The main camera I was using as my primary go-to camera for the wedding was the Canon C200. And we were shooting in 4K RAW with that camera. And then... The other, we had two other cameras, which was the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. So we were using Pocket 6K and Pocket 4K cameras. So one Pocket 4K, one Pocket 6K, and the Canon C200 as our main cameras. And then the EOS R5 was basically used to basically get the epic B-roll shots and, and some pickup shots as well. So number one, it wasn't the main camera. So I know a lot of you guys are probably going to be like, well, you didn't really use it throughout the wedding. No, we did. We did. We got shots of the groom and the brides during the preparation. We got shots um, after the ceremony when everybody was taking pictures and getting the stuff at the cocktail hour. We used it during throughout the reception with dancing and the party, the party entrance. And then we used it also at the very end for like, this they were doing like these sparkle flaring things so we got shots of that as well and again most of this stuff was 4k 60 and then there was a couple 4k 120s as well understanding just right out the front this is not 
an A camera. I went in knowing this isn't an A camera. And I didn't try to force it to make it an A camera. I knew the limitations the camera had and I used what I had, the, my knowledge of those limitations, and used it in a sense that I can maximize the, the quality that I get out of this image. Most of the time it was on the, D, the DJI Ronin S. We set the Ronin S down and then we would pick it up with either the, my C200 or one of the two pocket cameras that we were using on the event as well. So that's number one. Basically, it wasn't the main dedicated camera. The image that was coming out of this camera was freaking gorgeous. I mean freaking gorgeous. It was beautiful. I love, uh, especially like there's the shots with the groom and his groomsmen uh, in 4K 120. It was just, it was just awesome. Now I mentioned that we didn't use it through the ceremony. And that is mainly because it, the, my friend who was basically the director of this wedding basically said he wanted everything on sticks and he just wanted everybody on sticks and just basically aiming the different cameras uh, at the different points of the ceremony. So I was on my C200 and then he and another friend of ours was on the pocket cameras. Now, in the event where I have to rely on, uh, I didn't have my C200 and I would have to rely on the R5, could I use it for the ceremony? And the answer is yes. And my main reason why I would say yes, because typically most ceremonies are lasting between 30 to 45 minutes. Really, even then it's like, even then it may be 30, 45 minutes is a bit on the longer end. Usually it's like 30 minutes, 25, 30 minutes typically for the ceremonies that I have been a part of. That's how, typically how long they last. In those situations, I know for a fact that I have two modes that I could record the ceremony without any issues at all. The first one would be, obviously, I could just shoot the normal 4K and you would have no problem at all except maybe dealing with the, the uh, record limit. The second option, which would be the option I would prefer more, would be using basically this guy, the Atomos Ninja Inferno, attached it to the camera with a dummy battery and then removing the media cards from inside the camera and basically just using the Atomos as my main recorder. By that, I completely bypass all limitations of this camera in 4K24, which is really the only uh, frame rate I would be recording the ceremony in. I would bypass all of that. I can then use four, I can record 4K HQ pretty much almost unlimited with the Ninja Inferno without any issues of dealing with overheating. And then I would basically just also bypass the 30 minute record limit and I would also be able to use ProRes directly to the animal. So that is a three st strike win for me. Again, if I had to use the R5 for like the actual ceremony, I would still be comfortable doing it because I have an option like the Ninja Inferno where I can bypass the overheating limitation, I can bypass the recording limitation, and I can basically use a far more friendlier ProRes codec. Uh, for the computer, which I would definitely use in terms of long form content. This is essentially what I did for the interview for the interview that I did prior was basically I just used basically the Ninja Inferno and basically recorded to the Ninja Inferno and just shot ProRes and basically that basically saved my saved my tail uh, the entire time. Now I did only shoot 4K normal at that point because at that time I was not aware of the hack that you could use with an external recorder. So I didn't want to take the risk. In case you're wondering, oh, you didn't use it for the ceremony. I would have still used it for the ceremony. We just didn't because we didn't need to. And then I guess this also leads me into second reason that I was able to record for such a long period of time without overheating. When I am not recording, I shut the camera off every single time. I like as soon as I stopped recording, I turned the camera off and that was able to prolong the overheating time and to where I only got the overheating warning one time. And once that overheating warning came on, we shut the camera off, set it down, let it go. We picked up the C200 and the pocket cameras and we just recorded for like 15, 20 minutes using those cameras. And then I picked the camera back up 
start, and this was like around the cocktail reception time. I picked it up again to catch some more footage from the cocktail hour, and essentially the timer was roughly back to where it was before. So the key thing that you guys need to know is everybody keeps running the overheat, but they and they keep getting to the overheating warning and then shutting it down. What I have noticed is that as long as you don't actually overheat the camera, the recovery time still can pick up pretty well. I don't have this long 30, 40 minute recovery time where the camera doesn't, doesn't seem to turn back on and I don't get my time back. It's only when you actually force the camera to actually shut down. So you have a two minute warning. So basically what I would say is basically just make sure you don't actually overheat the camera. If you get the warning, turn the camera off, set it down for like 15, 20 minutes in a cool, relatively cool area, and then just use another camera to pick up the shots in the meantime. And finally, the last reason on how I was able to prolong the overheating uh, timer was sort of a pickup of what the second one is, but it's essentially what I did was I basically got more shot selective and also I made sure to set up my shots prior to turning the camera back on so I can reserve as much time uh, throughout the wedding. So essentially, like whenever we were getting shots, I would make sure I would basically visualize the shot I wanted first and then take the camera up, shoot, turn it on, start recording and doing that. If there was uh, some shots where we need some directing, we turn the camera off and then take the time to sort of direct, get the shot, get the, doing things that we want, turn the camera on and start, pull the camera up, start recording again. And basically that's, um, that again, just like turning the camera on and turning the camera back on, uh, basically being shot selective, make, being more precise with my shots and being precise of what I'm looking for, essentially allowed us to, as I've mentioned, I guess, throughout this video, be able to shoot the camera. And also it just kind of, I like it in a sense that it made me a better, it makes me a better filmmaker. It makes me a better shooter because now I'm thinking about my shots. I'm not just, just aiming, running, gun. Now I know for a lot of you guys, you guys are going to look at this like this is not something you should be doing on a wedding because what anything could happen a wedding where things switch up. The point I'm trying to make is you can still adjust, you can still adapt to uh, this while still being selective with your shots. You just got to be more thinking of your head like, okay, basically constantly thinking of what is the picture, what is the frame that I want to do. And if I can do that during a wedding when anything can happen, and uh, by the way, it, with this wedding, it was raining it was it, it was like pouring down raining and then like right before the ceremony started the sun came out and it became really really warm and really really hot basically the where the ceremony was sitting where it was going to be placed was last minute because the bride and the groom originally had their uh, their ceremony outside but because of the rain the venue was going to basically set everything inside where the reception was going to be but once things start clearing up the venue gave the okay and they basically moved everything back outside. So we basically had to re regroup and get everything set up for that. If I'm able to do that where I can get start thinking and thinking of my shots and setting that up on a wedding day, you can basically definitely do this as well. It just, again, it takes some time. It takes a little bit more dedication. And that's pretty much it. Again, I know you, there's going to be a lot of you guys looking and thinking you wanted to hear that we did this continuously. We just put the camera down and just let it run. And, but that's not the case. We knew what the record limit was. I knew what the record limit was. My guys knew what the record limit was. And we basically just worked around it. And basically we were, because we were able to just work around it, we knew what the record limits were. And we took the necessary steps to make sure we did not overheat the camera. We never came across the overheating issue. And let me just also point out that my friends, this was their first time really experiencing the R5. And, you know, they were really, try, you know, they were really giving it to me on our way to the venue and really talking a lot of smack about it. And by the end of it, when they saw the footage, when my boy saw the footage on his computer while he was editing it, he was like, oh my God, 
This is amazing. We're using the R5 all the time on Ronin S. This 4K 120 looks awesome. So the quality, basically what I'm trying to say is, why are we so willing to, why am I willing to really go the extra steps to really make the R5 work? And it basically just comes down to the fact that the quality is freaking amazing. It's one of the most amazing looking qualities, like in its, for the type of camera that it is. And because of that, just like with the Blackmagic Pocket cameras, which have battery life that are far worse to deal with than the overheating issues, because at least with the overheating, we kind of have an idea of when the timer is going to go off. But the Black Magic, they could be at 40% and then they just shut off out of nowhere. People like me, as well as people who love those Black Magic Pocket cameras, we still use them because the image is freaking amazing. And that is pretty much why we use this on this camera as well. The camera is amazing. So it is worth the effort to make it work. So I wanted to just show you that even people that had doubts about this camera, once they saw it in action, once they were able to see how it works, yeah, they didn't like the workflow. They were not feeling the workflow, but they saw the end results and they loved it. And at the end, if end of the day, and not only that, the clients loved it. So if the clients loved it and the client's clients love it, then to me, that is an absolute win. So if anybody tells you that you can't use it on a wedding, it's not, it's not for, made for professional videos, show them this video, show them how I did it. Obviously, if this is, something, this is something they're not willing to partake in, then that's fine. At this, But at least you know it is possible. You can absolutely throughout an entire wedding day with the R5 without overheating as long as you are understanding the limitations and you work with those limitations until Canon comes out with a firmware, if they ever do, to resolve the issue. Until then, just work with the camera's limitations and it is totally possible. Anyway, love to hear what you guys think of my, of my statements here. Let me know, leave a comment below, make sure to hit that subscribe button, and until next time, take care everyone.